the award-winning director of films such as Kathy Come Home, Kez and I, Daniel Blake, Ken Loach. I think we desperately need an election. Um, I, I think the, the problems this country faces, poverty, insecure work, homelessness, areas left desolate like the Northeast with no investment, huge problems, the collapsing uh, public services, the NHS desperate, um, again, for 100,000 vacancies in the NHS. We desperately need a, an election and we need a change of government. Now, whether... <laughs> when that comes, when that comes, has got to be... The, the problem we're facing now, and I absolutely understand the frustration of over three years' delay, that's a conservative delay. They've been in power. They've been fiddling around. They haven't been presenting the, the choice to you, or the, the choice of need. They haven't been carrying out the choice you made. But the, the choice, I think, that, that is important is that it, when a deal is there, it has to be one that won't destroy whole areas of the country like this area suffered in the 1980s. And at the moment, we have 50% of our exports going to the European Union. Now, we should have a deal that protects those, those workers in those industries and those uh, businesses. And if they are flooded with, with bureaucracy and tariffs, then some of them will go to the wall. Now, if people here want to vote to put people out of work, uh, I don't, but I absolutely think that the leaving the EU is what people voted for, and that should be respected. So what I would like to see <laughs> is a deal that we can vote for that will protect people's jobs, because otherwise, so many people are going to be put out of work. And we've lived through that. We've lived through that in the 80s and onwards. I have a son who works at Nissan. He's one of the 7,000 people who work at Nissan. And they have been informed that if there is no free trade deal, Nissan will go. And so will 7,000 jobs and 30,000 ancillary workers as well. This industry cannot survive without a free trade going deal. Devastating. We've been through this once, but we do not want to do it again. Um, I think the, the trick we're falling into is saying in order to leave, we have to leave with this deal. That's the problem. We could leave, and I would support a deal that's, that's protected what the, exactly um, the, the, the situation you're saying. The protected jobs at Nissan, protected all the companies that, uh, that provide um, the, the facility, the, the, the parts for Nissan. But, I mean, remember, Nissan is a just-in-time company. So parts are going backwards and forwards between here and Europe. Now, if that's complicated, if there's bureaucracy, if there's some issues with that, that's going to slow right down. So that's going to put pressure on Nissan. And not only Nissan, there are smaller firms. Um, talk to somebody who runs Tradecraft, which is a, a, a fair trade organisation. And their, their food goes to Rotterdam as a hub, and then before it comes to here for them to, to process. Now, that, again, is going to be massively complicated. So it's this deal is the problem. And we, I think we have to look again at that. But I think you're right. The destruction of these communities was one of the most cynical, most disgusting, most political acts, in the, in the, certainly in our lifetime. It was a conscious decision to destroy the mines because mine workers, because they were strong. They were strong. And the consequence, the consequence of the destruction of the mine workers was to weaken the trade unions, and that's why now we have the precarious jobs with people working 12 hours in vans, driving around, barely able to see their kids to get a, the beginnings of a living wage. And all, everything that's followed from that, the precarious working, and, and all those workers' rights will be lost if we leave the European Union. But we have precarious. No, no they won't. But we have precarious workers now. It's going to be a race no. to the bottom. No, we have exactly. But we have precarious working now in the EU, and we'll have it again, even worse, if Johnson's the Prime Minister. The, the one thing uh, remark that was made about Boris Johnson, and it is absolutely coming true, and this was in a, um, um, a man called Max Hastings, a, a Tory, a, a man who was Boris Hans Johnson's. Boss, And this is what he wrote about the premiership of Boris Johnson. He said, his premiership will almost certainly reveal a contempt for rules, precedent, order and stability. And that's what he's bringing us. I think we, 
the horror of it is watching the people who are in that freezing compartment with die one by one is an unimaginable horror. So let's mark that. Um, these came from China, apparently. Um, we know people tried to seek asylum for many other countries, war-torn <coughs> countries. I think we have to be much more intolerant of countries that abuse human rights, and China is certainly one of them. And there are many other countries as well, and we don't need to list them all. But I think we need, we need a United Nations. We need a United Nations that, that can actually impose some sense of morality on these on these self-seeking, warring nations. Um, I mean, if what's happened in th this incident is appalling, but it also what, what's happened to the Kurds is appalling. I mean, I'm surprised if Kurds aren't trying to cross because there, there's, there's a, an a, apparent approaching genocide there. So you talk about Turkey the Kurds in Syria, yes. and the US troops yes, have yes. withdrawn from Syria. Yes, e exactly. Part of Syria. Yes, exactly, the, the Trump's withdrawing the troops. Um, and, and again, um, that Turkey is part of NATO, and why are we allowing that if NATO has any function? Um, why are we allowing that? It's, um, it's, it's the general, de general destabilisation of the, the, global, the global structure and the, the appalling abuse of human rights, certainly in China, and I hold no brief for them, and, and in many other countries. And we've contributed to that with our illegal war in Iraq as well. So I think we have a much broader, more mature view of how we live in this planet together, you know, and how we inhabit it and how we preserve it. And let's, let's think in those terms, really, because that's the only way we'll save humanity from wrecking each other and doing these appalling self-sacrificial acts. It's a huge question, this. I think flexibility is fine, provided it's equal. If the worker can phone in and say, look, I'm sorry, I can't come in today, and there's no problem. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. It's going to cut fine. both ways. But, but I'd, I'd like to know what you would say, Norman, and what you would say to the widow of Don Lane. Don Lane was a 53-year-old van driver. He was diabetic. He had an appointment with a specialist at hospital. He went. He was fined £150 a day because he didn't provide a replacement driver and he, of course he lost his money and he had to pay for the van that he was renting or hiring. Um, he had further appointments and he couldn't go. He decided not to go because he'd be in debt. He didn't have the resources. He didn't go. He missed one appointment. He started to get ill. He missed a second appointment. His, his workmates were worried about him. He missed his third appointment. He collapsed and died. And he was 53. And he was a precarious worker driving one of the vans, the white vans. Now, you tell me that's justified. You tell me that's right, that a worker is so terrified to have a day off for sickness because he will be fined and therefore he dies. You tell me that's right. That's the gig economy. That's what it's doing to working people.